それではパネリストの皆様をご紹介いたしますお二方いらっしゃいますまずはバングラディシュ外務担当国務省シャリアール・アラム様ですはい、続いてはインド応用経済研究所上席研究顧問ラジェシュ・チャダ様です<笑>そして本セッションでのデモレモデレーターは日本経済新聞社日経エイジアンレビュー編集委員兼日本経済研究センター主任研究員山田剛が務めます。それではよろしくお願いいたしますはい、えー、皆さんこんにちは、えー、このセッションではですね、えー、南アジア地域の、えー、ビジネスチャンスと課題について、えー、ディスカッションを進めていきたいと思っております、えー、このセッションのタイトルにもありますように、えー、世界銀行のレポートによりますと、まあ、南アジアは、えー、グローバルグロースホットスポット、まあ、すなわち、まあ、成長の中心地ということで,です、ね、あの非常に、えー、高い成長が見込まれているということで、まあ、あの2017年の予測で、まあ、7% 前後の成長というものが、まあ、あのいろんなエコノミストの方のです、ね、予想に上がっております、えー、世界全体が大体まあ 3.5% の成長というふうに予測されている中では、まあ、非常に羨ましい限りと。ということでですね高成長が期待されるリアでありますでしかもこのインドやバングラデシュパキスタンそしてネパールスリランカ、まあ、こういった国々からなります南アジアなんですけれどもまず非常にですね人口が大きい、まあ、全部合わせますと17億人に迫ろうかというような人口規模がありますそしてものづくりですねあの市場として物を売る市場というだけではなくものづくりの拠点輸出拠点そして IT 情報技術ですとか研究開発の拠点としてもですねあの注目されておりますそして中央アジアそしてインド洋諸国、まあ、こうした国々とのですね、まあ、ゲートウェイとしての機能も将来的には期待ができるということで、まあ、非常に注目されているエリアでありますでその一方でもちろん課題リスクというものもまあ多数ありますインフラこれからどんどんですね作っていかなければいけません電力とか道路とかですねそしてもちろん貿易、これをいかに活性化させていくか、そして投資をいかに呼び込んでいくか、まあ、そのための新たな政策作りというものも重要になってまいります。こうした点で,です、ね、今回、インド、バングラデシュで、それぞれ経済研究や政策立案に関わっていらっしゃるお二方から、南アジアの経済統合について、最新の情勢分析、そしてご提案をお聞きしたいというふうに思います。では最初にバングラデシュのアラム大臣にご登壇をお願いいたします。アラム大臣はですね、パキスタンあ失礼バングラデシュのですね、まあ代表的なインダストリーであります、まあ繊維産業に関わっていらっしゃいまして、2008年に国会議員になられまして、2014年から現職になります。まあ非常にあの現在も IT や気候変動なんかの分などのですね分野でも非常にご活躍をされていらっしゃいます。まあ、若手の政治家のホープということだと思います。それでは、アラム大臣、プレゼンテーションをお願いいたします。Thank you.、Um, I must say in the beginning that、uh, sitting quiet for last two days in that corner, I almost forgot how to speak. But、uh, it's good that we have all listened to fantastic presentations. And、uh, here we come, as the moderator said,、uh, the The hot spot、uh, of the world, uh, uh, South Asia.、Uh, at the beginning, I would like to thank, on behalf of the Government of People's Republic of Bangladesh, uh, uh, Nikkei Foundation,、uh, for hosting and inviting us uh, in this uh, conference. And this is truly an eye opener for me uh, as well,、uh, because in the past,、uh, our engagement、uh, with Nikkei uh, wasn't.、Um, Uh, to the extent where、uh, we managed to speak or share a few things on behalf of our country.、Uh, having said all this,、uh, we discussed、uh, yesterday and this morning、uh, about the changing situation in the, in the West, especially the United States,、uh, the changes that Europe is going through.、Uh, so, in that backdrop,、um, obviously, even the moderator said、uh, why South Asia matters、uh, to the world. Uh, but uh, may I just politely remind you that、uh, 
uh, geographical location of uh, South Asia uh, uh, is, a, is a global strategic landscape. Uh, it connects the two other uh, fast growing uh, economies. Uh, one is Southeast Asia and another one is uh, Central Asia and South Asia sits right in the middle. Uh, it is also having some of the world's major power uh, like uh, China in its neighborhood. Uh, in, on the other hand, the Indian Ocean uh, has remained at the center of interest to the major player of the world because of its, uh, again, strategic location and natural resources at the same time. 66% uh, of the world's oil shipments, 33% of its bulk cargo, and 50% of the world's container traffic pass through its water. Uh, so that tells you uh, the economic uh, muscle that we have in that region or the prospect that we have. Uh, the, the oil arteries of the world flow through the Indian Ocean. Uh, it is not only trade and economy, the strategy significance, strategic significance of the Indian Ocean goes far beyond this region. A new world order is being emerged in and around the Indian Ocean, and more particularly the Bay of Bengal, where Bangladesh is situated. Now, uh, even though I personally don't like this term, but uh, uh, as many other uh, analysts and critics uh, often uses the paradoxical character uh, of this region. Uh, now, why we call it a paradox? That South Asia has been one of the fastest growing region, uh, as we all know, and the moderator said that uh, a huge market of 1.7 billion people with 9.12% of global wealth. Uh, it has registered economic growth of above 7% uh, over the last one decade, uh, despite global economic downturn. Uh, it is the home of the world's largest walkable population and one-fourth of the world's middle-class consumers. But on the other hand, the region contains the largest number of poor and undernourished in the world. Uh, back in 2015, approximately 281 million people in that region were malnourished uh, or, uh, or uh, undernourished. Uh, stated in a report published by uh, World Food uh, Organization. Uh, this is one of the least economically integrated regions of the world. So that gives you the opportunity how far we could go together if we get our act together, the member states in South Asia. Uh, the intra-regional trade in South Asia has hovered around 5% for the past decade, which is significantly lower uh, when compared to other regional arrangements such as ASEAN uh, that we talked about yesterday and today, uh, European Union and the North American Free Trade Association, NAFTA. Uh, Intra-regional investment is less than 1% of overall investment, uh, which is uh, very insignificant. Uh, overall unemployment rate in the region is around 3.9% of the total labor force. Uh, that's a World Bank study uh, that was uh, published in 2014. Now, what we are doing, obviously, we have a couple of platforms. Uh, we know about SARC, the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation. Uh, uh, originally started its journey from Dhaka in Bangladesh in 1985 with seven members. We now have eight members. Afghanistan is, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the latest inclusion. Uh, now, uh, I will uh, probably leave my uh, colleague in the DS to uh, share uh, his experience with SARC, but uh, uh, we, we expected much more out of SARC than what SARC has managed to deliver. But uh, on the other hand, we also have uh, another platform called BIMSTEC. But before I come into that, uh, let me uh, quickly highlight some of uh, uh, what Bangladesh is doing in South Asia. Uh, despite the global uncertainties, uh, developing Asia is expected to maintain a steady growth uh, as we earlier on said, World Bank forecasted we will continue to grow uh, in and around uh, 7%. Now, only a couple of weeks ago, PricewaterhouseCooper in his recent The World in 2050 uh, has predicted that India will be world's third and second largest economy by the year 2030 and 2050, respectively. And while Bangladesh will become 29th largest economy by 2030, um, and 23rd largest economy by 2050 in terms of GDP uh, at purchasing power parity. Uh, not only that, if we consider average real GDP growth uh, from 2016 to 2050, PricewaterhouseCoopers predicted uh, that Bangladesh uh, will be 
In the third place, with India, will be the second globally in terms of uh, GDP growth percentage uh, year on year. Uh, this year, uh, the year is yet to conclude in, in another uh, three weeks, uh, end of June, our financial year will end, and we forecast that our GDP growth will register 7.24%. Uh, Last year, it was 7.11%. Uh, now, we, Bangladesh, uh, not necessarily tried to be a leader in the region, but we, we are trying our best since the inception of SARC in 1985 to uh, try and lead the initiatives. Uh, now, obviously, uh, as you all know, we have uh, challenges uh, that uh, why uh, SARC uh, uh, or the South Asia uh, didn't manage to come as one unit as you are um, uh, trying to do under TPP uh, minus one, uh, TPP 11, uh, and ASEAN or European Union. Uh, the challenges really are the history historical political tensions and mistrust uh, with cross-border conflict and security concern uh, within the member states. Uh, countries are vulnerable uh, to emerging global challenges like terrorism, uh, radicalization, and violent extremism, uh, human trafficking, drug smuggling, and so on, and obviously climate change and disaster, natural disasters. Uh, interests are tariff and non-tariff barriers, and long sensitive lists are among the major barriers uh, to increased intra-regional trade. Uh, trade in the region is also uh, constrained by the inadequacy of trade and transport related infrastructure as well as congestion, high cost and delays. Now, we have just uh, presented our budget in the parliament uh, last week before I left on uh, uh, 2nd of uh, uh, June. Uh, and uh, we have uh, put forward a budget of $50 billion. And now, uh, Sitting in Japan, you know, 50 billion might not sound a, 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 that high of a number, but a, a country uh, that came into being, uh, fought it in independence and lost three million lives, uh, and uh, just a year before our in war of independence in 1971, in 1970, uh, if you Google it, uh, the largest uh, natural disaster where we lost uh, more than a million, a million lives uh, swept through Bangladesh in 1970. Uh, uh, and in 1969, we had flooding. In 1973, 74, we had droughts and then again flooding as well. Uh, so country was literally devastated. And the first budget of, uh, of Bangladesh uh, in 1972 was in the tune of only 100 million US dollars in today's exchange terms. Now, you can imagine how far uh, we, we, we have come uh, in the last 45 years. And not only 45 years, you know, if we consider uh, five, four to five years ago from today, we presented a budget, uh, the country's budget was only about $12 billion. So we have increased our budgetary allocation four times, 400% increase in the last uh, five years alone. Uh, there are, uh, Bangladesh is still considered to be a least developed country, but we aspire to become a middle income country by 2021, which is only about four years from today. Bangladesh was one of the first country or one of the fastest uh, growing country when we uh, successfully implemented and achieved uh, all of the MDG targets except the climate change related one that needed everyone else to act together. Uh, SDG, uh, and when at the UN, at, uh, at, at a multilateral forum, uh, we analyze why Bangladesh achieved MDG and many other countries failed, especially within the LDCs. Uh, Bangladesh successfully managed to align its national policies uh, along with its MDG targets. Uh, and the same applies for SDGs. Our seventh five-year plan uh, already uh, adopted all the SDG goals and targets. Um, we have managed to increase our per capita income year on year for the last uh, six, seven years at the rate of 10 to 12 percent, uh, so double-digit growth in, in per capita income. It's only still at, at around $1,650, uh, which qualify, you know, and you qualify to be a lower middle-income country already. Uh, and uh, the other two elements uh, that we need to satisfy is economic vulnerability index, and the other one is uh, 
uh, uh, your demographic uh, structure, uh, and we are on course in, in achieving those. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, as the moderator said, yes, we are challenged. Uh, we are yet to establish our first ever uh, deep seaport, and we are working with the government of Japan, uh, and uh, uh, we are also setting up very large uh, power plants uh, with, with help of Japan through JICA. Uh, we have built our, our road network and railway network is reasonably good. You can reach out to any corner, or let's say you can reach out to 95% of the population of 160 million within six to seven hours drive from the capital, uh, Dhaka. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we, we need to do a lot more than what we have done. Uh, very recently, we have undertaken an initiative under which we will be setting up 100 special economic zones. And there is uh, one uh, special economic zone for Japan uh, is uh, being allocated. Uh, another one is for China, and two in discussion uh, for India. Uh, and uh, in one of the recent studies uh, uh, done by JETRO, uh, suggests that Bangladesh is one of the uh, favorable country by Japanese uh, investors. Uh, and the growth of Japanese investment in Bangladesh is phenomenal um, uh, in, in recent past, especially after the two consecutive back-to-back -back visits, one by Bangladeshi Prime Minister uh, to Tokyo and uh, by uh, Mr. Abesan to Dhaka. Uh, and uh, we believe that such level of cooperation will uh, strengthen the economy further. And in terms of regional connectivity, obviously uh, some of you who are aware of the history, uh, we were part of one large country, India. When British left, uh, we were left with two, different, two countries, uh, India and Pakistan, uh, but we had to fight uh, the war in 1971 uh, to liberate Bangladesh uh, from Pakistan. But as far as regional connectivity is concerned, our aim, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's directive is very clear, that we want to go back to pre-65 days, 1965, when India and Pakistan uh, uh, were at war, and after that all those uh, connectivity uh, connections, rail roads were suspended. Uh, because uh, to reap the benefit of the fastest growing region and the demographic dividend with 70% of our population uh, below the age of 35, we really need to connect ourselves and give access uh, to people and uh, facilitate uh, people's to people's contact. Uh, so uh, I don't want to uh, uh, take on more time. I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, uh, in, in, in the next few minutes. Thank you. はい、